Has this ever happened to you? You have a person you care about, and they are making a huge mistake. And you can see it, but they can't. But no matter what you say to them, they just cannot hear you. They're just going to make that mistake maybe over and over again, and you are cursed to watch it happen. Does that sound familiar? Can't just be me. I love Midrash because it is a place where we see the ancient rabbis at their most creative, most imaginative, most playful. I'll give you an example from this week's portion, Parshat Vayera. We are told about the first seven plagues, the second of which is the plague of frogs. Endless droves of frogs climb out of the Nile, disrupting the lives of the Egyptians. But there is one verse in the Parsha where the word is not tzfardim, frogs, but tzfardea, frog. This might seem like nothing, but the rabbis never pass up an opportunity for some Torah fun. So they decide that this means that at the beginning of the plague, Moses and Aaron summon from the Nile one gigantic frog. Obviously. But if that's true, why then would frogs be written in the plural as well? The Midrash goes on to say it was a single frog, and when the Egyptians hit it, it splintered into several frogs, and then more and then more. They kept on hitting it until the land was overrun. Problem solved. I love this incredible image of one giant pyramid-sized frog climbing out of the Nile. But I also imagine how Moses might have felt watching the Egyptians make things worse and worse for themselves. Maybe he tried to tell them not to hit the colossal frog, but they did not listen. They hit it, and then they did it again, exacerbating the situation. Moses just has to watch it happen. This is that feeling that all of us know so well of wanting to speak to someone's pain or continued challenges, but them not being willing or able to hear us. Moses had to watch the Egyptians suffer because of their own choices, and I imagine this hurt him. How much more so does it hurt when it's someone we love or care about deeply? There's another moment in the Parsha where we see Moses experience this pain even more acutely. Before the plagues, before Moses goes to Pharaoh, God tells Moses to go to the Israelites and tell them that God was endeavoring to free them. Say to the children of Israel, I am the eternal. I will bring you out from beneath the burdens of Egypt. I will rescue you from servitude to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. I will bring you to the land which I promised your ancestors and give it to you. We would imagine these words would be stirring for the Israelites. Finally, after 400 years of slavery, God has come to redeem them. What exciting news this must have been. Well... It, it would have been if they had been able to hear it. We are told that Moses spoke all of these words to the children of Israel, but they did not listen to them because of their kotzer ruach, their shortness of spirit, and because of their avodah kasha, their hard labor. They did not hear Moses' message at all. Their hearts were too broken. I feel for Moses... How heartbreaking must it have been for him to deliver this rousing speech only to see the Israelites shrug and go back to making bricks. He cannot rouse them to even lift their heads from their toil that they might see a brighter future. Here, unlike with the Egyptians and the giant frog, they are not victims of their own bad choices, but even still they are unable to imagine a different way forward, one that Moses can already see. And so his attempt to inspire them towards liberation falls on deaf ears. We all know this feeling, too, of having a loved one, maybe a partner or a friend or a child. They are having a difficult time. They are depressed. They are hurting. And from our vantage point, we can see that things will get better, that this moment of sorrow will pass. But from where they sit, in the thick of it, there is no relief, no light at the end of the tunnel. And often, when we share with them that things will improve, that this too shall pass, they cannot see it or believe us. Parents in this room know this pain acutely. 
the child who is hurting from a skinned knee or a bruised ego or a broken heart. And we adults who have been through it before, we've had our own hearts broken and come out on the other side. We know that the wounds will heal, that the ego will rebound, that the heart goes on beating. But when we tell our kids this, sometimes they're not ready to hear us. Sometimes there is too much pain and they are in a state of kotzer ruach, their shortness of spirit, and our words, like Moses's, fall flat. What do we do when our words won't help? How do we deal with the reality that we can't change the situation, can't take away the pain, can't even lend some of our perspective? Our first challenge is to understand where they are coming from. Our first challenge is to listen. There is a tradition at Shiva, the seven days of visiting mourners after the death of a loved one, that we're not supposed to speak to the mourner until they speak to us. So often when a person is hurting, we want to say something that will make them feel better. But there's nothing we can say that will take away the pain. And sometimes our need to fix gets in the way of the mourner's need to be heard. So this tradition teaches us to listen before speaking, to let them lead. This does not mean we ignore the mourners, far from it. We position ourselves so that they know we're there, but we start by centering their needs, not ours. When we listen like this, we might discover that the pain is not exactly what we would have suspected. Rabbi Naftali Svi Berlin, also known as the Nitziv, comments on the relationship between the Israelites' kotzer ruach, shortness of spirit, and their avodah kasha, their hard labor. He suspects that it is not actually the hard labor of slavery that shortens their spirits, but the hard work that lies ahead. Rabbi Mark Wolf explains the Nitziv understands that what they really feared was the work they would need to do in the wilderness to become a free people serving God. When we listen to the person in the situation who is unable to change, we might understand more precisely what fears keep them from changing. Why does our loved one keep making the same mistake? Maybe they're not afraid of leaving. Maybe they're afraid of the hard work that comes after leaving. It is only when we really listen to them can we truly understand what is the source of their kotzer ruach, their shortness of spirit. And after we listen, we try to offer words of encouragement, comfort, and hope. We say, I hear you, and I also see a light that you cannot yet see. I've, see, I've been in this pit before, and I can tell you that I made it out. You may not believe me, but I am living testimony that it gets better. We try and paint a picture of hope. What does Moses do after the Israelites fail to hear him? He doesn't argue with them. He goes to Pharaoh to demand their freedom. He knows he cannot only describe the people's liberation to them for, him, for them to believe him. He has to go out and make it a reality. He must act with hope. Only then when they see his actions, perhaps, can they start to imagine it. But in the moment, it may feel like our words ring hollow. We may feel ineffectual, and here the rabbis also offer us a little relief. The Hasidic master, Reb Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, was discussing this text with his friend, Reb Menachem Mendel of Vorka. Apparently this was a very common name for Hasidic masters. How can it be, says Menachem of Kotsk, that the Israelites did not hear Moses' words. Didn't God tell Moses at the burning bush, they will hearken to your voice? Can it be that God was wrong? No, says Menachem of Vorka. God said they will hearken lekolecha, to your voice, and not bikolecha, in your voice. Which is to say, the, the distinction is that his voice alone is what the people will hear, not the specific content of his words. The people are too broken, too afraid to hear the details of his vision for hope. But this does not mean that the entire message was lost on them. They still heard the sound of his voice, and maybe that sound comforted them more than Moses knew, more than the Israelites themselves knew. As Rabbi Joshua Mikutis explains, in times of struggle we may feel that our words fall flat. Moses may perceive himself as having failed in his mission. However, from a different angle, his presence still had a palpable effect. 
I heard an Israeli teacher give a lecture recently. He was uh, giving out a bunch of statistics, and he said, don't worry about the details, just listen to the melody, by which he meant the overall trends in the statistics. And we know this is true. Sometimes the melody works on us even when the words are lost. What a comfort it might have been for Moses to know that even though the people were not yet ready to sing with him the song of freedom, the melody was already having an effect. It was already starting to open up their spirits and lift the heavy burden from their hearts. Even before they learned the song, the melody soothed them. And perhaps this is useful to remind ourselves when we are comforting a hurting child or conversing with a friend who cannot seem to escape a painful pattern. We have more impact than we can see in the moment. Our comfort is heard even when it does not remove the pain. The melody of our words may seep in more than we can tell in the moment. If we listen first, if we hold them in comfort and hope, maybe, just maybe, they will follow the sound of our voice and maybe someday they will be able to follow it all the way out of the darkness and find, once again, the light. Shabbat Shalom.